All right, Daniel 1, verse 3. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, and the children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding, science, and such as had ability in them to uh, stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Just right off the bat, um, where is this master of the eunuchs at the time? I've never heard anybody say this, <laughs> but it looks like from reading it, he's in Judah picking these guys out to bring back to Babylon. These are his instructions who to pick. Make sure you get all of these people and look for some good ones that will, you know, be good propaganda <laughs> poster boys for us. And that's what he does. He says, bring certain of the children of Israel. Where is he going to bring them in verse 18? Into the palace. So from where they were, they're going in to uh, see him. And that'd be quite a scary event to go in before the king who just conquered your land. And you don't know what he's going to do. These are the seed royal. These are the ones who had royalty running through their veins, and they're going in to see a man who is a killer. I would be a little nervous. He says, Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs. This is a, a guy who's in charge of probably the harem, the women, and he's a eunuch, so he's not fooling around with them. He's also a confidant of the king. All of these eunuchs had been someone that the king had learned to trust because he was over his women. But he, if he's doing his job correct, he starts to um, have a relationship with the king. And I think in this passage, what we have is he's also a military figure. He's saying, while you're over there, get me this and get me that. This is not new, though. This is something subtle in the Bible, but as you go through it, you'll find it. Remember what Israel wanted when they got a king. They wanted to be like all the other nations. You know what all the other nations had? They had concubines, and they had a eunuch that ran the concubines. So you know what Israel was doing? The same mess. No wonder God's mad at them. Look at it in 2 Kings 9. 2 Kings 9, verse 30. 2 Kings 9, 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Hillary heard of, uh, Jezebel heard of it, <laughs> and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out a window. And as Je Jehu entered in at the gate, she uh, said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? Uh, you, we've covered a whole sermon on that. He lifted up his face to the window and said, Who's on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. Now, she's got three of them. Why does she have three? We saw with the contradictory problem that she's running a house of prostitution, not only in the north, but in the south, in order to run the, the um, both kingdoms, verse 33. And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. Some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horse, and he trod under, or her underfoot. We would expect to find something wicked like that in the north with none other than Jezebel. Okay, well, we know that she's wicked, and she's not trying to model the kingdom on anything that God wrote down. She's doing it according to pagan principles. Look at it in chapter 20, 2 Kings 20. 2 Kings 20, verse 18. You'll find people who'll tell you that um, the Hebrew children in Daniel were not made eunuchs. But I think they were. Second Kings 20, verse 18. Of thy sons that shall issue from thee, 
which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. I think it makes it pretty clear. Uh, they're going to uh, follow suit. Now, the reason he's making them eunuchs is he's going to keep the focus where he wants it. You're going to keep, you're going to be a, 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 a satrap is the word they used. It means a governor in another land, but it's not for your own means. You're doing it for your boss, Babylon. Look at it in Isaiah 39. Isaiah 39, 5. This is the same story that we found in Kings, but I'm going to give it to you now in context and just notice the mindset. I don't, they were just different back then. Um, verse five, then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house, that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day, shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou hast beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. What? You think that's good? Is that a positive message? I wouldn't say so, but it was for him for the next sentence. He said, moreover, for there shall be peace uh, and truth in my days. Talk about pious and selfish. Hmm. Jeremiah 38. Jeremiah 38. Now, here we are in the south of the kingdom in Judah. How you say this guy's name? Um, then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Mal Malchiah. Uh, that's Jeremiah 38, 6. The son of Hemiac. That was in the court of the prisons. They let Jeremiah, uh, they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Now when Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the house, uh, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin. Now, do you know what we know about Ethiopia? Ethiopia was the king of Ethiopia came to uh, uh, Egypt as king, appointed by Assyria. So now you've got Ethiopians running Judah in Israel um, because they're answering to the, their big supposed protector, Egypt. So Egypt's got somebody there and got probably more than a few people making sure their interests are served. You'll find people who say that part of the deal is that they gave the... Um, Ark of the Covenant to the Ethiopians who did not take it to Egypt, but the Israelites thought they did. They took it back to Ethiopia. You'll find to this day there is a sect in Ethiopia who claims they have the Ark of the Covenant from this time period. That's why Joash goes after um, Pharaoh Necho when he comes through because he wants his Ark back. And um, that's, that's not Bible, that's conjecture from history. Jeremiah 41, Jeremiah 41, verse 16. Then took Jonathan, the son of, we'll call her Karen, <laughs> and all the captain of the forces that were with him, all the remnant of the people whom he had recovered from uh, Ishmael, the son of Neth. Netha, Nethaniah from Mitzvah, after that he had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, 
even the mighty men of war, and the women, and the children, and the eunuchs. Okay, so maybe the Ethiopian eunuchs are there, but probably their own eunuchs that they had made. Just like Jezebel had made some, they were probably making their own in the south, in Judah as well, whom he had brought again from Gibeon. Look at verse 28. Uh, Jeremiah 52, 28. This is the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive. In the seventh, seventh year, 3,000 Jews and 3,020, and three and 20. So these are the conquests of Nebuchadnezzar. And he's going to go through and he's going to tell you all of the things he took. He goes through, look at verse 25. He took also out of the city an eunuch, which had charge of the men of war. Okay, so a eunuch is not only in charge of the harem, but he's also in a position of authority. Um, you find these men that are the wise men supposed to be in the, the school, the theological school there in Babylon with Daniel. They're supposed to be men that the king can trust. He asked them about going to war. He asked them about interpretations of dreams. This is how he's going to rule his kingdom, and he's putting trust in these eunuchs for it. He says this eunuch is in charge uh, of the men of war. And seven men of them that were near the king's uh, persons, which were found in the city, and the principal scribe of the host uh, who mustered the people of the land, and threescore men of the people of the land that were found in the midst of the city. Three times he's going to come in and he's going to depopulate Judah, um, not just once. All right, Daniel 1, Daniel 1, verse 4. I made it through one verse. He says to the eunuch, go over there and give me some men that I, will, I like so we can train up and, you know, use as propaganda. Verse 4. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. That is, they understood etiquette and whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. He says knowledge and understanding science. This is the first use of the word science in the Bible. Notice it's connected to something. It's connected to a pagan religious college. What they're doing here is they're teaching them astrology and astronomy, and it's connected to the house of his gods, and it's in Babylon. Science is one of the things that uh, is used to teach the kids you don't need God, and it's always been this way. Um. He says, uh, teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. So it's, it, he's supposed to learn their customs, not just how to speak Chaldean, but also how we act, how we interact, um, so that they can become a citizen and fit in in Chaldea. That's what the devil does. He wants you to fit in with his crowd. Daniel 1, look at verse 7. Unto whom the princes of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah Shadrach, and to Mishael uh, Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. Now, nobody remembers their Hebrew names, <laughs> except for there's something very interesting. In the book of, what's this book called? Shouldn't it be called Belteshazzar? <laughs> Belteshazzar, yeah. No, it's Daniel. That's the God-given name or the Hebrew name. And you'll notice even these Babylonians refer to him as Daniel, not the pagan name he was given. Look at it in chapter 4, Daniel 4, verse 8. Daniel 4, verse 8, the king is relaying this information. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom the spirit of the holy gods, uh, in 
whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and before for him I told the dream, saying, so forth, so on. So here the king, out of his own mouth, calls him Daniel. So now I gave him another name, but we're talking about Daniel. <laughs> That's how they knew him. Uh, look at it in chapter 5. Do what? Uh, Daniel 5, verse 12. It says, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called. He just told you it was Belteshazzar. Why didn't he say Belteshazzar be called? <laughs> no, it's Daniel. Something spiritual going on here. And he will show the interpretation. Even the pagans, it didn't feel right coming out of their mouth calling him by a phony god. They had to call him Daniel. <laughs> Genesis, Genesis 41. Now the king wanted to give them new education. He wanted to give them new citizenship, new religion, and so he changes their name. This is a pagan practice. I'm in other countries when somebody gets saved they give them a new name I think that's a pagan practice I mean you don't need a new name unless there's a problem with your name and then you go legally have it changed but the church doesn't have anything to do with that the church giving you a new name is pagan that's what they did here's Pharaoh doing it Genesis 41 45 and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath, and he gave him a wife, uh, Asenath, the daughter of uh, Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over uh, all the land of Egypt. So here, Joseph, when he comes to power, he's given a new name too, and no doubt it's after some pagan god. Second uh, King, Second Kings twenty three. Second Kings 23. Here's the king of Egypt coming through Judah, and he's uh, restructuring Judah. Judah at this point was a wimp of a nation, and uh, the other countries could come through and pick kings at will. Second Kings 23, 34. And Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Joash, king in the room of Joash's father and turned his name to Jehoiakim, and took Jehoahaz away, and he came to Egypt and died there. Second Kings 24. Second Kings 24, 17. And the king of Babylon made Mat um, Mataniah, his father's brother, king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. They've always got to change the name. Okay, you don't want the world's name on you. And that's what these boys were doing. But all the way through there, even I think it's a spiritual thing, God wouldn't let it come out of their mouth right. They wouldn't feel right when they said it. And that's the way it should be. When you're out in this mess of a world we're in, the lost world should feel uncomfortable when a curse word comes out of their mouth around you. They should apologize to you, but it has nothing to do with you. <laughs> it should be the God in you. Daniel 1, Daniel 1 verse 5. Daniel 1 5. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. This is good. They're eating high on the hog here. This is the same food the king is eating. You know, if the king's eating it, it's good stuff. He's not, everybody else can starve while he's doing well. <laughs> but here he's eating the same stuff. And of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. There's a lot in this verse. <laughs> Doesn't look like that, but it is. He gave them what to eat? Vegetables? No, gave them meat. <laughs> you want something to eat, you want meat. Now, it's obviously Daniel is going to switch it. 
and he's going to eat pulse, uh, bean soup or, you know, bear mush or something. Uh, what's the other thing that's like bear mush? That's what we had in the South. I don't know. It's called something else up North. Maybe. Um, but, uh, so that's vegetarian. So you could live on vegetarian diet. It won't kill you, but why try? <laughs> Don't take the chance. <laughs> Look at Matthew 5, Matthew, uh, Matthew 15, not 5, 15. Daniel's going to say, I'm not dare going to be defiled with all this mess. Give me something different to eat. <laughs> Matthew 5, verse 11. People will assume that it's because it's not kosher. But nobody's eating kosher in Babylon. <laughs> he wasn't required to eat kosher in Babylon. Um, he's just taking a stand because he doesn't, between he and God, he knows this is not something he's ever done before and God's not giving him peace about eating their slop. I don't think it was across the board. I don't think he was going around to every other Jew there and telling them you cannot eat this stuff. Um, and you'll see from his responses to the men in charge, he's not belligerent about it. Uh, it's a personal conviction he has between he and God. Matthew fifteen eleven. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man. So it wouldn't have mattered what he ate. But that which cometh out of the mouth defileth a man. Hmm. So how you speak. And we're going to find he does some amazing things. He responds to this hierarchy structure that's over him very nicely, politely, uh, and calmly while still standing his ground. Um, that is, he wasn't going to be defiled with maybe meat that had been offered to a false god. And he wasn't either going to be defiled by his flesh taking over and letting his lips start flapping. Now, both of those are difficult. Nebuchadnezzar tries to mold a new batch of psychological soldiers here by a, um, um, by a new identity. You know, he gave them new credentials. He um, gave them new names. All this is done in the hope that the heart of man will be changed. He wants them to go away sold on Babylon. He's not just doing them good because he suddenly decides he likes them. You don't make a man a eunuch because you like him <laughs> and feed him one good meal. Uh, no. Soon he'll learn, Nebuchadnezzar himself, that his title and education, even his position, is going to be revealed by God to be a beast. You don't change somebody's heart by sweet-talking them, by giving them good food, giving them a new name. None of that changes a man's heart. It's God who's in control of the heart. Look at Luke chapter uh, 13. Luke 13. Now, he said he nourished them for the, the plan was this. We're going to nourish them. We're going to feed, fatten them up. You, know, you fatten up a hog to take them to market. But he's going to fatten up these boys for three years. They've got a three-year institute course. Three years is important in your Bible. I say, as you go through your Bible, you'll find this system to be so, that three years is the first stage of Christian development. For three years, you're in a uh, training course. Luke 13, verse 7. Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why encumbereth the, it the ground? Three years you're supposed to be able to produce a minimum of fruit. And if you don't, then you're in rebellion. God thinks there's something wrong with you. Verse 8. And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Acts 20, Acts 20, verse 31. Acts 20, verse 31. Paul's going through the world now and um, setting up churches and 
teaching and preaching. Here's what he says. Acts 20, 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day in with tears. I'm saying you've, you're about to go on your own. I'm leaving now, but you've had three years. Now you're ready to stand. Galatians 1. Galatians 1, verse 18. Galatians 1, 18. It says, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Three years he's been in a training camp just with he and God. God came down and appeared to him and taught him all of the church age doctrine that we got. It was nothing that they knew he's going to go on in this book and he's going to talk about. Man didn't teach me this. I got this direct from God. And I went up there to see if they were on the same page and I had to rebuke Peter before I left. <laughs> Daniel 1, Daniel 1 verse 6. Um, we've read most of this. It's about the name change. Uh, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Well, we know wine is out. Now, the meat that he ate was probably, in his mind, defiled because it had been offered to a god. That was customary in a pagan land. Therefore, he requested of the princes and of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, it didn't start off with him taking a... Um, unwavering stand. The first thing he did was he purposed, and then he did something. If the heart's not right first, and the mouth starts moving right, the heart will fail quick. He purposed in his heart, God, between you and me, you said, don't do this, therefore I will not do it. Now I'm going to move based on the light you've given me, and that's what we have to do. He'd resolved to do right regardless of the cost, but God gave the right to choose the uh, to choose uh, to the ruler. We're going to find out the man he goes to is not the final say in this. Uh, what was his name? Um, what was the the eunuch's name that was in charge of him here? Uh, what's his name? Yeah, him. As Ashpenaz. Ashpenaz is not the end of the story. There's another one in here, too. And, of course, both of them answer to one higher, the king. And so it's really kind of a, a up in the air whether or not he's going to get this thing through. There's too many layers of authority. Sometimes it feels like that in life. There's too many layers of authority over me to get anything done that I need a request to be sent through. And, you know, if this one's right, they're all pagans here. None of them were particularly interested in helping him act like a, a Jew. <laughs> Galatians, Galatians 5. Galatians 5, verse 22. Daniel entreats his boss, the man over him, with a, with a peaceful, polite, calm demeanor and says, you know, would it be all right if I... Don't start acting like a heathen. <laughs> Dan, uh, not Daniel. Galatians, Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. All of those are not, when I read those names, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, it probably doesn't click in your mind any Christian leaders. <laughs> when I say any of those, it probably is not, your mind doesn't just automatically identify it as some great evangelist that you know. And it should, because this is the fruits of the Spirit. They should be exhibiting it. That's how we should be known. Now, that's the spirit that Daniel entreats with. There's no reason they should have answered him in the affirmative. 
They should have said, no, boy, you're a slave here. You'll do as you're told. But here he's beginning to see God move the king's heart, even though it didn't make sense to man. In Daniel 5, Daniel 5, verse 12. Daniel 5, 12. He says, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge, we've already read the verse. This is what he's talking about, Daniel. What Daniel was known for was an excellent spirit. Now, you don't understand what that excellent spirit is in the Old Testament. We just read it in Galatians. The fruit of the spirit is the excellent spirit. So he was spirit filled when he goes in there and asks for something. And the result is according to the will of the spirit. Again, Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21, verse 1. Even in a pagan land, this is true. He says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. God's still in control, regardless of how rampant it seems the devil gets to run roughshod over us. God's the one in control. Even the devil has to bend to God. So you appeal to him, regardless of how many Democrats are, I mean, uh, how many, <laughs> regardless of how wicked it gets. They had Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15, verse 1. He says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. So that's the spirit he's going in as. He's going in softly and requesting. He didn't demand. He didn't throw a fit. He says, is it okay if I don't become a pagan, you know, worthless, no good? No. <laughs> That's what we would have done. We'd have gone in there with a good message for him. <laughs> he wasn't the target. God was showing Daniel something. God was showing Daniel that I can control even your authorities over you in a pagan land. We think that's a no-brainer as a Christian. But an Israelite would have thought that something God was the God of Israel. Outside of Israel, they felt outside of his protection. Remember, that's why they started taking the Ark of the Covenant with them out to battle. Because they thought that thing is going to save us. God's with us right there. But outside the land, he's not there. And when the Ark's gone, we don't have his favor. God's showing Daniel, I'm with you. It's a personal thing. So he's got a touch of, new, of uh, church age right here. <laughs> okay, we'll start at Daniel 1-9 next week. 